Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, we need to check that clock. The clock back there seems to be about a minute um, late, so the staff could uh, make sure that clock is correct. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Mayor Commission work session. Uh, today is November 22nd, uh, 2021, and the time is 10 a.m. And uh, the first item uh, on the agenda is the uh, discussion of the Transit Village Project, an overview and update. Mr. Rook. Good morning, Mayor, City Commissioners. Chris Rook, Executive Director of the Community Redevelopment Agency. It is good to see you this morning. So, Mayor, may I just say one word before he gets started? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just briefly, just wanted to say that this request um, was prompted by the recent uh, vote on the extension of this project and, and really just looking for an overview. I know it's been a long time since this first came to us, although we have had some updates along the way. And so just wanted us to be more familiar with the project as I hope it's moving forward and, and getting closer to um, starting to work on it. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, and uh, that's great to hear, Commissioner, because that's exactly what I've prepared today. Um, this... <laughs> okay, we're all on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> so um, th th there are a lot of moving parts uh, relative to specifically the incentive agreement that the CRA has with this project. So um, I, I have no doubt that you'll have lots of questions, um, but I I I've spoken with um, Administrator Johnson about this, and uh, we're happy to schedule a, uh, a another work session with the CRA on this item um, to answer any additional questions that you may have after this presentation, because uh, I do anticipate that there will be um, a lot of follow-ups on that. So, and then I'm also uh, always available to answer any questions that you may have um, on this uh, on this program and this effort. So, great. So uh, Transit Village uh, is a very ambitious project, um, but uh, has recently um, uh, attracted some additional investors um, with, uh, in addition to uh, Mr. Mazinoff. Um, uh, many, many of you may have seen the article that is in the newspaper with related companies out of Miami that is now um, uh, involved in this project, which is uh, really great because they bring just a tremendous amount of expertise uh, I think, um, to this project. And we actually had a meeting with uh, Mr. Mazinoff and the representatives from Related um, probably about a, maybe about 10, 10 days ago now. Um, and it was a very productive meeting. So um, it's, it's encouraging to see uh, such uh, professional, um, you know, talent being brought forward on this. So anyways, uh, I'll go over a quick overview of the project just to kind of bring you up to speed, high level details on what's involved. Um, this project is entitled, so um, it, it, it can pull a building permit. Um, there's a lease agreement that's associated with it, uh, mainly on the west side of Tamarin Avenue, which is the Seaboard train station parcel. Um, the incentive agreement, which has a lot of the moving parts. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, and then uh, also, as it relates to the incentive agreement and some of the things that the CRA is obligated to do, I did want to give a very brief update on where we are on uh, sort of the site plan that we are obligated to submit on Mr. Ma uh, on Transit Village's behalf, and then also some of the maintenance of the Seaboard train station, which um, is ongoing, and then happy to answer any questions that you all may have. So uh, just a quick overview. This is where Tri-Rail um, arrives daily and is a major stop um, for that service that connects, this, connects the uh, West Palm Beach to the Southeast Florida region and is that commuter rail service. So that's uh, facing north, which is uh, the right side of your screen. Tamron Avenue is towards the bottom. Clear Water Drive is to the west, with uh, the northern boundary being Banyan Boulevard. The parcel that Transit Village predominantly is going to be built on is that wedge parcel that is owned by the county um, and, and uh, is uh, leased to, I, I believe it's leased. Uh, they have an agreement, the RFP is, is with Transit Village and the county. And then the red parcel is the one that is owned by the city, uh, which does have a lease on it uh, for improvements. And then where the star is located is the historic seaboard train station um, which is uh, a, a great a great building and uh, historic part of the city. So Transit Village, um, as I mentioned, it has a lot of 
different components to it. Um, currently, what is approved by the city uh, involves uh, residential, a hotel, um, quite a bit of office space um, that, uh, that, that is located with the project, um, but also a tremendous amount of civic use, um, which I'll get into a little bit more. Um, again, just high level details, but um, there is a component uh, that uh, the incentive agreement is used um, in order to help pay for that, that civic use and that public open space. So the lease agreement, uh, again, which is this parcel along uh, Tamron Avenue uh, that includes the Seaboard train station was originally entered into in 2018. Um, the whole purpose of this was the idea that the Palm Trans service could be relocated onto this parcel. And that was really something that um, I, I think has been reviewed and looked at several times as um, either a potential temporary and potentially permanent relocation of that Palm Trans service. Um, to the uh, to the west side of Tamron Avenue in order to just improve functionality and things like that. Um, I really can't comment too much on the traffic or if that's a good idea or not. Um, that is something that really involves engineering, but um, that was the purpose of leasing this, uh, this parcel. Um, that was amended last year, August 5th, 2020. And with that, um, with that amendment, uh, we agreed to do the site plan, uh, which is what we're currently working on, um, but also it included that maintenance requirement that uh, deferred the, we would start working on the deferred maintenance, assuming that we get reimbursed for both that site plan and that deferred <coughs> maintenance um, once the project is under construction. And then uh, because we've been working on that over this past year through a series of negotiations and just understanding of how that uh, Palm Trans service may be located over there, um, we did get a little bit behind. And so as a result did ask for, uh, or uh, uh, Transit Village did request a, um, a, a 11th month extension to that agreement, um, primarily due to just being a little bit behind on getting that site plan approved, but we are moving forward. Um, as of last week, we had a follow-up uh, meeting with Alta Planning, who is doing the planning project and they are um, they understand the new schedule and they are going to be working expeditiously moving forward so the incentive agreement which um, is a very large document um, it uh, it has uh, quite a bit of moving parts in it is a 25 million dollar um, tax increment agreement for a, a public podium and and street and, and public realm improvements for the overall project now this um, as a tax increment incentive, those funds are not paid out until the project is actually completed and starts generating revenue, at which point we then refund it back into the project. Um, it does include in that agreement, uh, there is that community benefits. Commissioner Warren, I know that, you, that that is something that you have asked me about. Um, so I do have some summaries of that community benefits, and I'll leave that with you once at the conclusion of my presentation so that you can review that. Um, that was actually provided me by Mr. Lewis, Bruce, where are you at? Bruce, um, he, uh, he was kind enough to provide that summary to me. So I, I will share that all with you, but it gets into a lot of the different things that uh, include items such as um, uh, the, the street improvements, um, but also has some workforce, uh, workforce housing components, uh, job, uh, job uh, requirements as far as hiring locally and things like that. So, um, and this was that that package was directed um, by this board back in 2016. So that was something that the CRA was pretty cognizant about moving forward. Um, in this incentive agreement, it's important to note that the lease of the parcel, and this is where the CRA and the city get connected, the lease of that parcel on Tamron Avenue is mentioned in this incentive agreement. So you, all of this is sort of coordinated and connected, and you had the coordination between the CRA and city. Um, it also includes uh, a lot of different things like it, making sure that the term of the CRA is extended out to 2046, um, and that was made to make sure that the payments continue um, through the life of the CRA, um, and that that public benefits portion of, uh, of the incentive agreement um, commences six months prior to the construction. So it's something that they have to do before they even start putting a shovel in the ground. Um, 
A couple of other things to notice, uh, and this is where I think you'll, you'll probably want uh, a little bit more details. I can't get into all of them right now because it is, uh, like I mentioned, a lot of moving parts, but there is uh, the option to actually purchase uh, from the CRA the public, uh, a portion of the public podium plaza, um, as well as um, a aspect of payment in lieu of taxes um, for that podium plaza, which is a public space. So again, um, I, I don't have time to get into all of those details, have all of the backup, happy to share it with you and have a, a lot of future discussions. Um, so that incentive agreement uh, back in 2020 uh, was extended for that three year period. And then we just recently did the amendment on November 1st to extend that incentive agreement by that 11th month so that the lease, the lease extension and the incentive agreement both um, are on the same schedule. And that's because they both require the commencement of, a, uh, of construction for the overall project. So um, the new deadline for all of this is uh, July 13th, 2024, as when commencement of construction or the movement of the ITC to the Tamron Avenue site occurs. So now, uh, just want to talk a little bit about where we are with those two obligations that we have under uh, the recent amendment. Um, again, this is the amendment that happened last year where we took on the obligation of submitting on behalf of Transit Village the site plan for the Tamarind site. Um, so this is a concept that was generated by Alta um, that we have been working on and uh, various departments have been looking at this, um, but it gives you a general idea of what that concept looks like. And this is really broken in over two phases. Um, and that um, the only portion that really Transit Village um, is mainly concerned about is the north end, that's the right side of the parcel because that is the, the section of the parcel that they are leasing. However, from the city's perspective, planning, engineering, um, and others have expressed the need to sort of look at the entire parcel holistically, which is why we have a much bigger concept and site plan before you being reviewed now. And currently, Transit Village, um, it, it's the, the cost for their portion of this is about $67,000 $67, currently. And so that's what we would ask them to reimburse us for on the maintenance costs, or I'm sorry, on the site plan costs. On the maintenance, um, it you know being any historic building, there's just sort of general requirements that are are, are needed to just make sure that that building stays up and running. Um, uh, I'm not going to get into too much of that. Um, really, uh, we've been relying, we the CRA have been relying quite a bit on the Housing and Community Development Department, which has been doing, doing a great job of keeping track of this maintenance. Um, I was working uh, late last week and over the weekend, couldn't quite get that that cost estimate on what how much we've spent in the uh, deferred maintenance and just making sure that we stay on top of those things, but I can get that backup information for you um, at, a, at a later date. Um, but again, we'll work with Transit Village under the agreement. We have to just confer with them on those deferred maintenance costs, and then that's another item that would be reimbursed by the, oh, great, hot off the press. You ask and you receive. Yeah, ask and you shall receive. So currently it looks about $53,000 in deferred maintenance costs that we have done to date. So, boom, thank you HCD. Jennifer, if you're watching, I appreciate it. Oh, I take that back, it's on both sides. It's a little bit more. It's about, uh, it's, it's about $90,000. So, thanks again HCD, I appreciate that. And we'll get reimbursed for those costs by Transit Village, correct? That is correct. <clears throat> So next steps that need to occur related to what we have um, uh, under our current obligations is that we are hyper-focused on getting that site plan approved because that is really an essential part of moving this project forward. Um, so we are, uh, like I mentioned, we're working with Alta Planning to make sure that that stays an aggressive benchmark for this project, obviously staying on top of the maintenance of the seaboard train station and what we need to do to make sure that that facility stays operational. Um, and then we will monitor these reimbursement amounts and, and, and keep in coordination with Transit Village on what they will be owed. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, 
And I know you just got a copy of the Community Benefits Agreement, but I would like to at some point uh, get up to speed on the workforce housing requirement. Uh, clearly, as our city continues to grow, uh, workforce housing is even more uh, important. So I'd like to see what we have uh, uh, already in the works or at least been promised by the Transit Village team. If you could get that to me ASAP, please, unless you have it now. Mayor, uh, I anticipated that question. So under the current agreement, um, it, it's important to note that it asks that at least 40 units be out of the 408 units that this project currently has, that 40 of those units are workforce housing. Now, what uh, they have to remain below 140% of area median income, which may be based on recent discussions of what we've had. I think we're shooting for a little bit uh, of a lower amount for that. Um, so that might be something to look at in the future. Okay. Um, are there opportunities to revisit that? Um, I or think, uh, well, etched in stone. If, if we have a, a current agreement right now, that might be a bit difficult, but I think it's always worth having the conversation with Transit Village on the area median income amounts. But Definitely, Mayor. If the agreement provides the specifics, it would have to be subject to negotiations. Okay. Uh, and not only the uh, median uh, AMI, uh, but even the number of units, uh, 40 units out of 408. Uh, in a transit-oriented uh, development that's only 10 percent. That seems low. And hopefully we could find an opportunity perhaps to increase that number uh, going forward. But you and I will talk about that, Mr. Rube, and I'm, I'm sure there will be opportunities when Transit Village comes to us looking for something, and perhaps we can um, have that as part of our discussion. Questions from commissioners. Commissioner Lambert. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you for bringing up um, affordable housing and, and the discussion on how we might be able to bring that up in the future. Similarly, um, Mr. Rugg, I know that you mentioned early in the presentation about traffic and engineering. Can you talk about that a little bit more? I think you mentioned that maybe engineering might have more to say about that. You know, I just am thinking about when this was first proposed, how much the city has changed since then, in addition to talks about UF coming here into this area. And I just wanna make sure that we're thinking about that and that we have, we're continually looking at um, how traffic impacts this area. A absolutely. Um, it, you know, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, even though the city has changed quite a, bit, uh, quite, quite a bit since this project was um, envisioned and, and the incentive agreement was drafted, that um, a lot of the spirit within that, um, within the document still exists and are, are very much applicable to what we're trying to do. And it's essentially, uh, if you look at the whereas clauses, they include things like, you know, making sure that this is a one park solution where you just come there and then you use other modes of transportation, enhancing pedestrian experiences, making it very <coughs> easy for people to move around and using this very much as a hub. And so if we just sort of keep that spirit of, of the original agreement and the resolution in which this was passed under, I think that that's a, that's a great initial sort of premise and principle that we can continue to look at the project moving forward. I think um, engineering is definitely on top of all of that. And I, I know speaking with Alta, um, you know, there's been a lot of talks about design of how this whole thing could look from a transit planning center. But um, mostly, as you can see here, when we start looking at things like um, on, on the purple line, you really can't see it because I had to I had to crop this photo. Um, but that purple line is sort of a multi use path for bicycles and pedestrians. Um, you know, making that safe, comfortable connection across Tamarind Avenue from Clematis Street, which is a, um, a highly used uh, uh, crossing for pedestrians and just making sure that that remains safe and consistent at grade level. Um, things like that, that I think um, we'll continue to make sure are in place when we submit this site plan. Um, but I will tell you that engineering is very much in favor of making sure that this is sort of a, a people first design. Um, in all of the conversations that I've had. And even initially before she left, uh, Wen Dang was a part of the design as well. And I have uh, uh, another rendering that 
uh, is a little bit more polished, but actually looks at the entire Tamron Corridor all the way down to Okeechobee, shows the Fern Street crossing. Cr crossing. So there is um, a lot more that is being assessed from our engineering and from a transportation perspective, and I only see that increasing. Great. Well, I appreciate it. And I think something else you said in the presentation is that we're looking at this holistically. And I appreciate that because there are a lot of moving parts, a historic building, lease, lease, uh, tenant leases here as well. So thank you. I appreciate this update. Uh, Commissioner Warren. I'd just like to thank you, Mr. Ruge. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Mr. Mazinoff and Mr. Lewis for being so responsive to my inquiries. Uh, Mr. Mazinoff re responded immediately to questions and provided the, uh, the agreement within hours of our meeting. So I certainly appreciate him giving me the opportunity to, revert, to review that information. Um, thank you also to the mayor for your emphasis on workforce housing and the fact that this is such a priority for the community. And I, I think that it's a higher priority than we've, we, than we've seen in recent times. So I, um, if any opportunity that we have to review, um, perhaps increasing that, I think would be beneficial to the entire city. Um, I, I would be interested in hearing more, although not this moment, but I would be interested in hearing more about what we have been able to accomplish as it relates to uh, the community benefits program. And I'd also like to know more about what the plan of engagement is and what, what the action plan is for that community benefits and group. So um, a, a couple of, uh, of noteworthy points, Commissioner, to, to what you had just mentioned is that um, in order to implement this program, they do have to put together a, uh, a committee that involves uh, some not-for-profit organizations and um, and consist of representatives um, of some of those community-based nonprofits um, before they they get that off and running. But they will have that implementation. And then the other um, po uh, component that is worth noting is that they have to actually retain a coordinator to make sure that a lot of these aspects are in fact implemented um, as part of the, the developer's obligation. So that's a couple of things I think that um, are worth pointing out um, and uh, a variety of other items that uh, I'm happy to share with you as well. Okay, thank you very much. And when we get to the point of uh, the, the job fairs, what I've noticed is that job fairs aren't resonating well with people in the community. So I would like to challenge you to come up with the, a creative way to um, to advertise those opportunities, and I um, I'm hoping that they're inclusive of uh, reentry citizens, and that we emphasize uh, training to be able to help people build their skill sets and their resumes. Understood. Thank you, Commissioner Fox. Thank you so much for bringing this to us. I live only a couple blocks away from here, and so I'm very excited to see this area um, really thriving. And I think right now it's dark. It's not as clean as it could be. Um, there's a lot of um, convenient parts to getting on the tri-rail, but I think not as many people are utilizing it because of just some of those safety issues. So I'm really excited about this. I know you mentioned that you might be coming back to us for an, an update more or further presentation. I'm just wondering if you can have possibly someone from engineering come and speak to us a little bit about the mobility that they're looking at. I think we have talked so much recently about the tent site and how that at one point was thought to be maybe a mobility hub. And I have always thought that didn't make the most amount of sense because living in New York, for example, you would have Grand Central or something. You'd take the train and then maybe you'd go out and get in a cab or go downstairs and get on um, a subway. And it makes the most sense to me to have the transit hub where we have the transit. And so we already have so many of those items here, knowing that Brightline is only a couple blocks away, but that also we have this th thriving city with people coming here every day that we're looking at what are the other options that we could have, whether it's you know, buses down Okeechobee or you know, metro rails or people movers or whatever the ideas are. I know that there's a lot of talks about that now, but you know, I think that this location would be the ideal place for other opportunities that might be coming down the road. And I don't know what kind of space there would be here or what if some of those are already being thought of now to incorporate in this. But it would be great if you come when you come back, if we could have more of an update possibly from engineering about some of the things they're thinking about or um, just 
how they anticipate all these things moving together. Thank you so much. Commissioner Warren. I don't know if I mentioned this already, but I think it's worth noting again how wonderful it is to look at an opportunity to transition from a brownfield to a greenfield. That's a huge, huge thing. So I just really wanted to bring some attention to that. Any other questions, comments? All right. Thank you, Mr. Rook, for their presentation. And uh, we look for, forward to future conversations. All right, the next item is Howard Park Community Center Architectural Designs. Ms. Rockwell. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, Administrator Johnson, Kimberly, Ms. Rothenberg. So I'm here today to talk about the Howard Park Community Center. Um, we do have two presentations for you this morning. Uh, this is I'm sorry, I'm Leah Rockwell, the Director of Parks and Recreation. This is a penny sales tax project, just to start you off with where this funding is coming from. The funding is just shy of $5 million for this project. Um, we've had a great deal of public engagement, including online surveys, um, park intercept surveys, uh, gathering information. We've had a presentation actually in the park as an event so that people can come out and actually feel the designs while they're actually standing in the area where the community center uh, is to be placed. The existing community center was built in the 60s. It's small, it's um, antiquated, it does not currently meet ADA standards as far as our restrooms. I mean, we have made them ADA accessible, but we'd like to bring them up to current really awesome code and give the community what they deserve as far as a community center. I'm not going to go on and on. I'm going to let our two architects uh, provide information regarding their two designs. They are very different. And that's why we're here today, because the community themselves could not give us a definitive answer as to which of the two designs they preferred. We did take it to the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee. They do have a recommendation of which one they prefer, but I'd like for you all to take a look at them before I give you Prax recommendation. And uh, with that being said, I'd like to, um, who's, who's going first? Do we know? So let's go alphabetically. Um, Alfonso Hernandez, Architects. We have Alfonso Hernandez who will present his um, design. So come on up and Let's get your design set up and ready to go. So I'm going to use, I imagine, the arrow right here. Okay, got it. Okay, uh, well. Good morning, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to be able to present this project. Um, if it's okay, I think I might be allowed to remove this for now. Yeah, that's so, fine. So, uh, again, uh, I do appreciate being here. My name is Alfonso Hernandez. I'm an architect. I'm here uh, located um, in uh, downtown West Palm Beach. The address is 222 Clamata Street. And, again, uh, I've been uh, really uh, excited to be able to present this. It's been a great opportunity uh, to have had an opportunity to, again to meet with the community and to work with staff to be able to provide this uh, this vision for you guys. So I'd like to go ahead and just kind of take you through it. I think I'm good. This is Mr. Armin, by the way. He's our, our job captain. Thank you. Keeps me in line too. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned, the project um, um, is is one that we've been working for a while. We really wanted to have a, just a, a chance to kind of share with everybody uh, what this vision is. And so um, I'm just gonna start out with telling a little bit about the history. Uh, briefly, don't wanna take too much time, but just to kind of explain that uh, Howard Park really has been an important part of the, of the city. Um, it's actually, at one point, was basically the edge of civilization as we knew it, right at Howard Park. And that's where you had docks that would come in 
um, from uh, the glades and they would do uh, bring in produce and so forth. So it's been kind of a, an important part. Also, there was, a, as you can see, some of the images on the bottom. Uh, the military also trained during uh, World War II here. Uh, there was a, a training area and that's also part of the armory. Um, some of the history of the place. So uh, it's, it's been really a, quite an interesting place uh, for, the, uh, for the city. And it's, it's also in a very important part that I wanted to share is a story about D.D. Howard. So D.D. Howard, uh, where the park is named after um, D.D. Howard because he really did a lot for this area. One of the things that he did that was really important is that he created um, basically the vision for a park. And that's something that, uh, again, eventually took his name. He was, um, you know, the superintendent at the time in the 1930s. And one of the really interesting things that D.D. Howard did is not just uh, created the park, um, uh, basically allowed for, uh, you know, this park to, to grow the way that, it, that it's grown. And he did something pretty interesting. He also donated trees um, throughout um, uh, Broward, Dade, and Palm Beach County. It happened to be the Royal Punciana that uh, was very colorful, was very bright, and he thought it really worked very well down in South Florida and being, <coughs> being in this location where the warmth is something that really symbolized and that resonated with him. And so we've taken all these ideas and basically uh, now we want to be, uh, basically present uh, how D.D. Howard became uh, very instrumental in the way that we approach this project. So um, as you can see, this is the existing park. Uh, you have the parking lot right in the center. On the right-hand side of that, which is a pink uh, structure, really is the existing uh, facility. And as um, um, uh, it was stated, it's really too small, it's outdated, and there's a lot of things that are not working with it. So that's really where the main work is going to be. And there's also some shuffle boards that in time, at this point, it's really not used anymore. It was really important at one point, but no longer really applicable. And so as we continue um, in the design, then that's basically the focus. And one of the things that we also uh, did that we thought was pretty interesting is really to try to understand what is the context of the place, especially, specifically, for the civic structures. In this case, obviously, the convention center is uh, located uh, just adjacent uh, to the east side. We have the Kravitz Center, and you'll see the structure there. Um, and then right on the other side of this, we have this uh, kind of industrial area, uh, which is also um, pretty exciting, a lot of interesting things that are going um, in this location, and obviously the armory building to the right-hand side. So this is some of the more of the, the context of where we're located and the proximity of the building to the other structures. Um, and now as we start looking at the building, um, one of the areas that we were looking at, and as uh, Lee had mentioned, is that there is uh, a limited amount of funding for this particular project. So in this case, we have the existing building, which is very close to Parker um, Avenue. And on Parker Avenue, the, a great place for it is because Basically, it keeps the cost low. Uh, we're not destroying the parking lot. We're not destroying other areas. So it really made a lot of sense for it to be located in that particular location. And that's what we have proposed. And in this case, we have an open green area that's uh, uh, right in front of it. So it may be a great opportunity for, let's say, events to happen in, in those places. Um, so moving on, let's say as we look at the building, again, one of the things that inspired us is, again, D.D. Howard and the Royal Punciana. And so here, in this case, we'll see the, uh, that beautiful flowering tree that's located on um, Parker, which is where we're proposing to have it. And so um, the structure is basically, uh, it's basically wrapping or, or hugging, let's say, the tree and basically embracing the community. And that's what this gentle curve really means to do. And so the building itself uh, has a lot of interesting ideas and functions, and really the idea is to bring community together. And so in this case, as you come through, you have obviously uh, the entrance desk, uh, a little bit of a sitting area, and the item number two there you see uh, highlighted is, is a cafe, so that the community now, you know, as uh, these days are different than the way it used to be. People now get together <coughs> in cafes, be able to enjoy refreshments, etc. so we have that included. And then obviously there's other functions in there. So there may be a gymnasium uh, location and it really is something that potentially could develop even further uh, depending on what uh, the needs of the, uh, of the community, and in this case working with staff, it may change. And then um, a little bit further to the right is going to be basically an area where uh, let's say folks can potentially lease out that space for a party. And so it becomes really um, a very a nice social area 
as a banquet room and it's got a small kitchen as well that can service the area. And so on the other side on number 12 is really where the community has a multi-purpose room and they could do different, uh, uh, let's say, events and different things that happen in there. So there's a simplicity in the envelope in order for us to reduce and try to keep the cost low, but at the same time open um, so that it allows for a, a very interesting and let's say uh, a very strong focal point as you approach the building. So as we, come, as we continue in through the design, as I mentioned, one of the things that's very important to us is how, how, what do you want to feel as you come into a park? And so one of the things that we're very interested in is looking at nature itself and, and the relationship of a building and people to nature. That's why we go to a park. And so for us, that story was really very important. And so as we look at um, you know, what this potential vision is, and again, understanding different uh, comments and also feedback from the community, uh, we realized that this could uh, really work with us. So we have a lot of shading elements. We have um, some columns that in some cases become a little bit more, uh, let's say, sculptural in, in shape. And this is something that, um, you know, historically for architects, we really do enjoy the opportunity uh, to be able to tie in art and architecture as, as fluid as possible. So as you can see here, uh, some of the ideas that we talked about is basically this, where you have a very strong focus as to what the building is, where it's located. It's very inviting as far as to see visitors can come. You have areas for bikes, obviously for folks to be able to enjoy. And then you could always see that glimpse of the beautiful Royal Poinciana, which is off to the left-hand side. So as you come through in this case, uh, we do have D.D. Uh, D. Howard's, uh, that's the idea of this Royal Poinciana, also implemented into the architecture itself. And so there is, let's say, this metal cladding, which creates these shadows, uh, not just shadows as you come through, but also on the canopy. And then the idea is when light hits it, depending on the different times of the day, there's a shadow of leaf patterns that are going to be basically uh, radiating from one side to the other. So the idea is, again, is to really try to feel and, and, and very much being close to nature. And so as we take you through the other images, again, you're going to see some of those same uh, principles and ideas. So sometimes just by creating light and shade, it allows to have a dramatic effect on, on, the, on a facade. And so um, the tree, again, is a reminder of what Didi Howard did. Uh, the tree is also the reminder of, of being attached to history and then looking at to see how uh, one may be able to continue through and see inside the building. And so in this case, uh, we're going to take you just, the, the camera basically walks around the park so you can see the rest of it. So uh, this view is located a little bit along the south side, and you can see the idea is to really be engaged with pedestrians, people potentially sitting outside, enjoying some of the environment. And as you come through, this is on the other side of the banquet room. So from the banquet area, you can slide the doors open and now be engaged on an exterior area. So it may be really pleasant, let's say for have a wedding or a party or something like that, would be, again, something that's uh, hopefully very enjoyable. And that's why we thought it would be great to have a shading area at that particular location. And so in this case, uh, the columns are just not a straight column, but they do have a little bit more of a sculptural feel. Now, the final, final design will happen as we continue developing the project, but this is a vision that we thought may be uh, worthwhile sharing. Um, and as we continue again, the idea of having nature and having plants, in this case, we have a row of, of, uh, of, uh, of palms, but we also have some oaks along the side, and the idea is to create shade and engagement for people to be able to, to uh, sit, enjoy, and also relate to the structure as much as possible. So we have a nice green area in front of the building. So let's say uh, it could be great for events, it could be great for just enjoying taking the family out there. And again, having this backdrop of the building, which uh, actually creates a really nice definition of the edge um, of this perimeter for the park. And then again, as you continue walking to the other sides, again, you're reminded with the beautiful World Poinciana, which is located and is very uh, clear and, and you can actually see that. And also, again, the idea is that you take that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, thought process and we applied it to the panels that are located above the windows. So also the light as it comes through, it creates these beautiful patterns on the ground and it becomes something really enjoyable uh, for those that are using the building. So it's not just the outside, but it's how the shadows and light works inside the building. Um, and then as we continue the camera at the end, you'll see, let's say, as you're leaving the park, uh, you get a glimpse of, um, of, of the concept, 
which was again that this relationship between nature, this particular gesture from D.D. Howard and the building itself. And then as I mentioned on the inside, we really had an interesting uh, a program and uh, the program really it involved a lot of the information that the community was seeking. The community was asking uh, to have an area for engagement and so even though we live in a uh, you know in, in a COVID uh, times right now we hope that in, in, in time whether we all will mask or we won't wear a mask we still need to uh, come together as a community and that's what we were looking to do is to have a nice uh, cafe to be able to have a sitting area for uh, in the lobby in which you can actually um, enjoy, let's say, uh, storytelling. And I'll explain that in the next images as we come across. But some of the ideas that you see there is that in a community, uh, we want to be able to not just uh, come together as a community, but also, for example, and may maybe that, uh, let's say there's a story that um, staff wants to share or wants to tell about the history of the park. And so we want to be able to have a, a location where they sit, where they enjoy, and be able to tell the story. Maybe the story is about D.D. Howard, it could be about the Everglades, or it could be the connection of what the building is doing to the environment. So these are the type of relationships that we're looking for. And of course, to be able to, again, have exercise in other areas that are really uh, very interesting and hopefully very engaging to the community. And so as you can see, that's really the idea. The light comes through, and these are just patterns of light um, that have these leaf patterns that will be able to create this beautiful uh, arrangement, as you can see, on the walls and in the areas. And as you can see, beyond where the person's sitting, there's a storytelling uh, location at that particular uh, area. And as you look beyond, you also see the tree, which is, again, part of sculpture and part of, part of the architecture as well. And from the inside, looking uh, towards the east, you see uh, a little bit of the uh, cafe on the right hand side, sitting area, be able to again enjoy that type of feeling from a distance. Uh, we're able to see a glimpse of the park. We're able to see the other parts uh, that are actually pretty special. And again, the idea is again to be have that connection to nature, and that's what this idea, this what what this design's about. And again, see the patterns on the floor and other areas as well. And so uh, that basically just. Um, um, explains what, what, what the building and the structure is about. And then this slide really is just to kind of reiterate uh, some of the feedback that we received, which I thought was pretty important uh, to be able to share with you all so you can kind of see some of the mindset. So in this case, um, there was um, 293 uh, folks who had uh, surveyed this particular design, and I think we had an overwhelming, uh, very high support uh, between the four and five, uh, 56 and 21%. Um, and obviously, the, there's a moderate as well. So in total, uh, between uh, the three, four, and five, it's about 90% of approval. And the highest votes, again, are about 163. Now, not everybody uh, you know, uh, loved it. Um, I think there was 6% which uh, rated a little bit lower and 2% which rated it low. So we, we really do feel that uh, the majority of the people who um, reviewed the project really did enjoy it, did enjoy some of these ideas and wanted to share some of the comments that we did, um, that we received, which were very encouraging. So in this case, for example, the first one says, showcases the history and inspiration be, uh, behind the architecture in a beautiful eye-catching way. Um, it's a conversation starter. I also like that every element has an explanation and ties back to the tree inspiration. So that's very much what we explained. A few more, just if it's okay with you all. Um, it has a new feeling. Um, of a vibrant neighborhood and it will draw users from up and coming neighborhoods to the west of the railroad track. So I think it does try to bring in uh, some. Uh, the strong um, incorporates, uh, or this. I, I think that meant this, this strongly incorporates uh, a nature inspired design. So these are some of the ones that are, are quite nice. Um, and just a few more here. Uh, openness of lobby area. I love the idea of a cafe and gym for the community. I would certainly capitalize on such things. My family takes daily walks to Howard Park and this would make uh, all the more enjoyable. So again, these are some of, again, very enjoyable uh, feedback. Um, I like the modern feel and how it still evokes a feeling of nature. I love that the roof uh, feels like a tree canopy. So again, those are just some of the comments. Now, uh, we also realize that there is a lot of nostalgic in the community. So uh, there are some folks who, um, again, I think their heart is and the fact that they don't want to see a lot of changes. And I, and I get that. But we do have a vibrant city. And this vibrant city, uh, if there's any constant, it's that there's change. There's always change. So 
Um, I understand and I'm willing, very, very, I'll be very eager to work with staff to make sure that we can incorporate um, all the, the feedback as much as we can. But as far as we're concerned, we've pretty much uh, reached out um, and we've gotten really positive feedback from everybody. And that's something that we're very proud of. So thank you very much for your, for your time. And if there's any questions, let me know. Otherwise, uh, uh, we'll allow uh, uh, the next team to, to come and present. Thank you. Any questions? Comments. Okay. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Show. I just had a question for staff, Mayor, if I could. Okay. We have a question for staff. Okay. Thank you, Alfonso. So, um, moving on. I have a question for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Schoff. Commissioner Schoff. Thank you very much, Leah. I was just wondering, on the presentations that we'll be seeing today, was there a budget presented to architecture so that the, the pictures that we're seeing would be very executable according to the budget that we have? Yes. So where we're at right now is these are conceptual designs. And when we make a selection, hopefully this morning, um, on the final architect that will move forward with the project, they will design to the budget. So based on, based on what they're presenting today. Okay. So the pictures being presented today are yes. reasonably within a budget yes. with some options. Okay, thank you. Yes, but I, there, I'd like to just also say that um, we are in different times right now. So it's a, there are some moving targets with the cost of products and services that are we're having some issues with as far as construction goes. But by the time the designs have been completed, we're hoping that, of course, some of those costs will have come down. Sure, and certainly understand the, the construction budget constraints. I've yeah. had some professional calls just like that this morning. Um, but as we're looking at it, these are executable. We're not looking at anything that uh, there were budget parameters given. Yes, thank you. Commissioner Lambert. All right. So, and they did, both teams did provide us with preliminary budgets based on the designs, which we insisted that the budgets and the designs were within our budget, so. Commissioner Lambert. Thank you, just a quick question about the contents within the community center. Did you give direction on that, or was that up for interpretation by each of the designers? The community actually gave the input as to what they'd like to see within the community centers as well as staff. So we spent a great deal of time um, providing different surveys from the community and deciphering that information as well as they heard directly from the community at our different engagement outreaches. So. The space that we've asked that's being designed is um, space that it can be changed. For instance, um, on Alfonso's design, he had a banquet room, which really is also going to be a multi-purpose room that can be used for a variety of things, not just banquets. He just happened to have it set up as a place where you might have a wedding or something like that. So all of the spaces will be able to be utilized in a variety of different ways, like most of our community centers. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, I guess I didn't realize we would be selecting. So You're is not. that what we're doing here? We're serving no. as a selection board? That's what, that, that is what we're asking, is okay. that you help us make that decision because the community themselves could not make a decision. So now we have to go above the community, which would now be the city commissioners and the mayor to give us direction as to which architect to move forward with. Okay. All right, I didn't know we were selecting either. And the question I have for the city attorney, since this is a workshop and at a formal meeting, whether I'll let is... the Yeah, okay. I'll let the city attorney, but we, we didn't tee it up as a special city commission meeting wherein you all would be making the selection. We teed it up as a work session where we can get input from the board on preference. Right. So this right. is not a formal selection. We're just offering right. input. Input, yes. And no, you don't. You do not vote at your um, work sessions. 
so, so right. So we're just going to talk. It, Correct. And I'm yes. We're going to have a formal motion and second and actual formal vote. Right. Correct, Mayor. No votes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Moving okay. On. Any other questions for staff? Okay. Next team. So next we have CPZ Architects, Chris Zimmerman and Joseph Barry. I don't know which one is going to be giving the presentation today. Um, just as a, a point of reference, they also did the fire station four, which is adjacent in the park. So we're going to let them give their presentation now. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Good morning, uh, CPZ Architects. We're really happy to be here this morning and uh, wish you all a good morning. CPZ Architects is right here in West Palm as well. Uh, we have 17 people. We're really engaging firms, so you'll see some of our, of our members here today. We've got Tony and Chris and Joe. They've all been involved in this project. We have a real collaborative office environment um, I'm Chris Zimmerman. I am the principal and owner of CPZ Architects with over 36 years of experience in parks and rec. And you can kind of see in the bottom fire station four. We're really proud of that. Worked a lot with the community. Joe Barry's here with me today as well. He's another registered architect in our office and going to play the key role. He will be your architect of record on this project, has put a lot of effort into it. Uh, as I said, we're right here in West Palm, 1601 uh, Belvedere Road. We are a small business. Uh, we're really proud of this, and I think you'll see a lot of this come out. We had a lot of community engagement when we did this. We started with a modern design and went to all sorts of designs as we worked through the community to come up with this mission-style building that represents the community and the people within that uh, neighborhood. Uh, again, a lot of engagement with the community. But one thing before we go into Joe's presentation on the building, I just want to point out one really cool thing that we do as a firm is community engagement. This is a community center we just opened in Doral just before COVID. But what was engaging was we did art in public places. And we actually brought a blacksmith in and the city set up community engagement in the park. And they, they did blacksmithing. And when they worked on this, they, they created these leaves and pieces of a sculpture that are now, um, you can see everybody got their hands dirty. It, it was a great weekend, but it's all part of this art in the middle of the community center. So it, it's that kind of thing that, that CPZ really likes to do. We give back to the community with uh, memorials and things like that. So I uh, just wanted to just kind of say who we are. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. He's done a lot of work on the project and can introduce you to you, the project. All right. Uh, thanks, Chris. Good morning, everybody. So just continuing the thought that Chris put out there about uh, community involvement and some of the things that were already discussed this morning, uh, one of the first parts uh, or how we got introduced to this project was uh, through the RFQ process. And in that, there were uh, surveys that were provided to us that the community was um, part of. And some key words kind of repeated themselves. And you can see some of them here, you know, community, uh, neighborhood events, art in public spaces, paintings, education. Uh, so these kind of things are what led us to the direction that we went in the original conceptual design. And then we continued that thought process throughout. We met with the community back in, I think it was July, and we had a presentation, both firms did. And we met with the community and we shared with them our thoughts and our renderings and our ideas on the community center. And we asked questions and we got a lot of, a lot of feedback. Again, a uh, second survey went out to the public and, and we listened. 
you know, and some of the things that we, we heard, pay homage to the neighborhood, relate to the park, indoor, outdoor relationships. Uh, security was a big issue and, and a repeated thought that, that uh, came up. And a lot of people like the traditional style architecture, keeping in with the neighborhood. And as Chris said, when we did Station 4, through that process, we originally started with a modern building. The community led us to the design that you see today. Budget awareness. We talked about it earlier. Leah brought it up. Yes, we are aware of the, the, the city's budget. And through the process, we brought in professional cost estimators. And we worked with them to develop this budget. We kept in mind that um, in order to help maximize the building and minimize budget impacts, we looked at tr traditional construction materials and methods. We also looked at repurposing some of the c existing community center, and you'll see some of that in the slides to come. We visited the site. <clears throat> We, we took notes on uh, things that, that we sort of noticed. And one thing was there are many points of entrance to the park. And one thing that m maybe we want to look at is incorporating a common gateway, a theme, so that there's a, a sense of arrival at all of these various points. The first thing that we did when we saw the RFQ when we read the, the, the client, I'm um, sorry, the uh, neighborhood comments, it was deciding on where to position this building. We thought that leaving the parking lot where it is made sense, both from a budget standpoint, but also from a functionality point of view. We thought of this building as not just a building place on the park, but a building that's part of the functions of the park, integral with the park. We looked at how to maintain a great level of visibility for security reasons so that we have clear line of sight through the project. We incorporated the existing roof trusses of the community center and refurbishing uh, the restrooms that exist there. Uh, repurposing those trusses into an outdoor pavilion. You'll see some renderings later on. In terms of the building, there's a 9,000 square foot building that's proposed. Uh, 6,600 square feet roughly is indoor space, another 2,400 square feet of covered porch. So what this does, it helps us bring the indoor activities out, outdoor activities in. There's that relationship between the building and the park activities. We thought about creating uh, art walls where art activities could take place and art can be displayed. There's a central point within the building at the reception where one single person can have full visibility of not only the building interior and the functions that are happening there, but also views to the outside. So to look at in a large portion of the plan, we have a general reception area, some offices, but also a kids, uh, kids club, sorry. A place where families can come, adults can do some work at the cafe, and you'll see some images uh, to come. But a place where a family can come, spend the afternoon, spend a weekend, and the kids club directly off of the reception area. So again, that single point can have visibility of, of that area, which is very important from a security standpoint. We incorporate multi-purpose rooms. They can have the flexibility of serving small groups, 30 people, 20 people, but also large enough to serve bigger functions, 100 plus people. There's a kitchen that can serve both of those rooms are all of these, these uh, the, the, the rooms within this building, but also support the cafe, a social place, a gathering place. Again, for families to meet, friends to meet, to do some work or just to enjoy conversation. 
All of these spaces have the ability to expand to the exterior, again, again engaging the outdoor activities. The elevations you'll see, very traditional in nature, keeping in line with the residential neighborhood behind it, and also reflecting some of the design influence from Station 4. The top view is a view from Parker Avenue. The bottom view is from the lawn looking west. Again, top view, north elevation looking south. Bottom view is that looking north through the Great Lawn area. You can see in that bottom image, even in the top image, the transparency through functionality through the visibility. This is a view heading up Parker Avenue. You see the outdoor activity area uh, to the right, pergola area, an extension of that multi-purpose room. And then the northwest corner is what we're calling the gateway. The gateway not only to the community center but to the park. Because again, it's not just a building at the park. It is the park. And we like the, the, the concept of, of, of incorporating all of those current activities and supplementing it with this building. So as you enter, you're outside. You're in the park. You're undercover. You have the community center on your right with a lot of glass. That glass is undercover shaded a sustainable thought process there as you enter from the park this is a view from that existing gazebo in, roughly in that area you'll see the open pavilion on your left you see the open activity area on your right where yoga classes painting classes can occur outside undercover the pavilion, repurposing the existing community center trusses, creating an outdoor space. The restrooms on the east and west of this are existing. Their interior space now, we can refurbish those and use them to help support the park activities. The lawn area, families can gather Activities can take place. If you see that, that Howard uh, mural, it's a, a, a homage to the existing building and some of the community uh, participation in creating that. This is a view inside the reception area looking through the glass. You can see that center lawn area, again, bringing inside out the cafe is in the background. A view looking through the cafe, again, to the exterior, layering these activities, both inside and out. A view of the overall. You can see we even paid attention to where we would put mechanical equipment, both from a constructability standpoint, budget standpoint, and not to have equipment on the ground. We would put them on the roof. Out of sight, easy to maintain, and efficient in the way we distribute those services to the building. And Chris? Thanks, Joe. Just in closing, um, we're, we're excited about the building. We, we think it, it really responds to the community and the park, pulling it up on Parker Avenue and opening that up to the lawn and creating those community spaces that really engage families and kids and a, an art festival or something, that the building becomes an integrated part of the park. Uh, I think that's what Joe was trying to, to really push here is that we kind of kind of forwarded it up on Parker and used that land as it moved forward. Uh, 
it stopped. But anyway, trying to engage, and we were really sustainable. The fire station was a LEED certified building, so we're looking at LEED certification on the building. That's why you saw a lot of glass, a lot of canopies, a lot of things like that. We, we really paid attention to how it responds, so it could be LEED certified just like your fire station that's there. Um, we do do budgets. You mentioned budget, and we have a professional cost estimator we use on all our projects. Matter of fact, they, we use them with the CM at risk on your fire station just to make sure that the CM was pricing your job appropriately, and they were within 5%. So it was a good, Hedricks did a good job on that, that building. So, and we actually value engineered that building and saved a half a million dollars on tilt wall. So working with that really, really paid off for the city. So we're, we're looking forward to another great project on that park, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions for this team? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So those are the two designs. They are very different um, and very unique in their own ways. And we're just looking for some input to help us make a final decision on um, which direction to go in for uh, moving forward with a final design and construction of the Howard Park Tennis Center. Okay. Um, with that being said, I did promise you after their um, presentations that I would let you know what PRAC thought. And they're leaning towards Alfonso um, Hernandez's design just because they thought it was unique and different and um, something that the city hasn't seen. <coughs> so that's what their original um, recommendation was to the city commission. All right, before we enter into that conversation, I think Commissioner Schof had some. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know we're not voting here today, commissioners, but in an abundance of caution, I wanted to disclose that I have hired Alfonso Hernandez Architects for a residential project. I've been advised by the um, ethics department and by the city attorney that it would not represent a voting conflict, but just wanted to disclose. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. I don't know how. Okay. We got a couple of hands up, so it looks like it's going to drive itself. So we'll start with Commissioner Fox and then Commissioner Lambert. Thank you so much, Leah. I just had a couple of logistical questions. I know both of the proposals included a cafe, and I wasn't sure. Was that something part of the RFQ? Is that something we would operate or that it was just a cafe where people would sit and bring their own drinks or I just wanted a little bit more background. So the, the idea was um, it, it was thrown in there as one of the items for them to consider in their design process. With people now working remotely from home uh, as it has become more of a norm, we felt that having a cafe where an internet cafe where people could come and sit and uh, maybe work while their kids are in a, a two-hour program or something like that would lend itself to a really nice uh, space for our community as well as we were told people walking through the park always think about they'd like to stop somewhere and get a cup of coffee and sit and because there's some beautiful trees in the park so there there have been requests for something like that at the center so that would be something we would bring in another operator, or how did, would that, do you think that would work? Most likely we would bring in a, a, an operator. Okay. And I just wanted to clarify one more thing. Do, I'm assuming all the fields and the dog parks and everything are just left as they are? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Commissioner Lambert. Thank you so much, and thank you to the two firms that presented today and, and for your continued work in our city. I think it's great. I, know the works of, of both of your firms throughout our city and it's both very um, it's stellar and I'm pleased to see that you're interested in Howard Park as well so thank you. Leah I have a question before I give my feedback on the um, designs can when you say that the when you say that you got community input on it I'd like a little just a bit of a summary of the community input you got I'm guessing that it revolved around what you just said, a cafe. I do recall, it's been over a year since we started this process, you know, the community space was a big piece of it, but I just want to know what else you heard, uh, you know, an overarching summary of that. And then when you say the community didn't come to a decision on one way or another, what, what does that mean exactly? So we sent out a, a, we sent out a poll 
uh, to all the neighborhood associations that surround um, that area. And we asked them to give us their thoughts on the two designs. And in getting their results, not one of the designs came out above and beyond the others. They weren't like, definitely we want to go with this one or definitely we want to go with that one. It was just kind of like, it, they, they weren't, there was no commitment from the community. They both, they came some just what they liked about one and what they liked about the other and what they didn't like about one and what they didn't like about the other. So as much as we got a lot of input from them, we really didn't get a definitive answer. Um, but, but in that, we did incorporate a lot of the stuff from prior to this design, all the input that we got from them from, they wanted like a, a room that they might be able to do aerobics in or yoga in, a, a banquet area, a, a small kitchen for events, um, a place for kids. So all that stuff was incorporated in the designs. Okay. Um, you know, I drive by this park almost every single day or I ride by it or I run by it. And I will tell you what I see the most there are families mm -hmm. and families who I don't generally see out at some of our other cafes or um, restaurants. It reminds me of my own family when, you know, that's where we held my birthday party every year was in the park. We had a piñata, you know, it was the whole family, the whole neighborhood came out for it and it was a very special place. And so that was something that I was looking for in these designs was where did I see families feeling very comfortable, um, families of all backgrounds, of all socioeconomic levels. Um, you know, both were, were beautiful presentations, but um, you know, when I first saw the mission style, um, I thought that that really complemented the neighborhood. But I did feel, I was thinking about those families, and when I looked at it, I felt like that looked more office-like and more just structural, where uh, the first design, you know, in, in implemented the trees, and I just felt like it was more of a relationship with the outdoors. So I did appreciate that. Although, with the mission style, you know, I really did like that outside cover area. I think the more shade we can provide, the better I see these families huddled underneath um, either trees or some of the structures that we have in the neighborhood. And so I think um, I think they both uh, included a lot of shade structures, but I just want to make sure we focus on that. Um, and I love the open air feeling of the first presentation. I, I don't know if it was just the photos that were shown, because I know in the second one there was the wall of windows as well, or glass at the entrance, but I just felt like I could see through it, and I could see like this is very inviting, it's not closed off. For families who might be like, I don't know what's in there. I, I don't know if I'm allowed in there. That's you know not for me, that's for somebody else. And so those were the things that I thought about when these two were presented to us. All right, thank you. Um, any other comments? Uh, my, my preference would be the, um, uh, the, the first one. Uh, first of all, thank you both for uh, expressing interest in uh, the park and in presenting to us. Uh, both are, are, are excellent uh, work product. Uh, unfortunately, I guess we've been asked to pick one or the other, it does not in any way diminish the quality of the one um, that, that, I, that, that you know, is not selected or what, although we're not doing a formal selection, but I, I did want to certainly get it out there that I think both are, are excellent and, and would be uh, very welcome additions to the park. Uh, if I had to choose uh, or uh, direction which I'm leaning, it would be for uh, the, the first uh, uh, team, uh, I, I like how they even incorporated the nature aspect of it, and th th there's a story there. Um, but uh, it, it's close, so uh, just uh, my preference. I'm leaning toward the, the first one, and I don't want to go into a lot of details because it makes it seem like I'm putting down the one that I'm not preferring, which I'm not at all. I think either of them would be very good, but if I'm asked to at least weigh in on it, I would go with the fir first one for a variety of reasons. Commissioner Schof. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you for bringing forward two great local companies, which is awesome to see, and two great concepts. I had a question as to the RFP. Were there elements that were required within each RFP? Did both 
applicants or, or both presenters incorporate everything that was required within the RFP beyond the, the legal portion, of course, but as far as requirements that staff would have put in for the specifics. Yes, absolutely. They both did. Great. And were there any requirements for things like LEED certified buildings, et cetera? No. Um, what we're leaning towards at the, at the least is LEED certifiable um, versus actually going for the final LEED certification. Sure. No, and, and I agree with, with my colleagues and with the mayor. Certainly two really great presentations. Um, you know, I think I always look to PRAC as well um, and weigh in their advisory and looking at them advising and, and hearing some feedback here from the dais of looking at uh, option one. I think it certainly does provide um, something that's in contrast to what's currently in the neighborhood but still complements the overall view. Um, the second applicant, again, had a beautiful building, does complement what's existing there, but just it's whether we're looking to um, look at what's existing and, and continue that or look at something that has a slight variation. So certainly um, happy to look in that direction as we're looking to provide some feedback today and uh, go with option one. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lambert. Thank you. I do have a few other questions as it relates to design work. As Commissioner mentioned, the cafe, that also grabbed my attention because I, I don't know, do we operate any other cafes in any of our community centers? Currently, no. Okay. You know, I mean, we have a lot of great restaurants in the city, although I can see the need for, you know, drinks and quick bites for families. I, I recently went to the St. Petersburg Pier and um, saw that they had just a small little place like that that, you know, would be more family friendly. I would, you know, I appreciate that. You, I think we mentioned in one of or both of the presentations, people who, you know, work from home. I think there's a lot of places like that already. And I would just want to make sure that this focuses on our families' needs and their needs for snacks, um, because that also makes the kids happy and want to <laughs> come back. Um, the other was, it looked like on one of the presentations that there might have been a door access from the outside. I don't know if that was to bathrooms. Like, will there be access to, how, will there be outdoor access to the bathrooms, or is this the only bathrooms in that park? I can't even well, remember. We're, we're still in, of course, we'll go into full design, but yes, there will have to be access to bathrooms from the exterior. So for when the community center isn't open, um, that there are bathrooms available as well as if somebody doesn't necessarily want to walk into the center to use a restroom, they can use the park restroom in lieu of. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how final the design, I, I hear you saying we have some leeway with that. Something that I think would be beneficial to the community would be um, the ability to take a multi-purpose room and segment it. Mm -hmm. And instead of it being segmented on either sides of the building, that if it was extremely large and we could segment it off, and maybe it's always in half except for that once or twice a year right. when we need to have it larger, I think would be very beneficial. That's our intent. We usually, in our multi-purpose rooms, if you uh, look at many of them, uh, Coleman Park, for instance, it's a small community room, but it does divide into two separate rooms for two separate activities. So that, that would be our intent, to have dividers to divide up the space for additional activities and opportunities. Great. And I know that a lot of our activities had to change to be at home during COVID, but one of my favorite memories of uh, this park is a huge Easter egg roll, Easter hunt, egg hunt in that park. And I just look forward to us getting back to those kinds of activities. Oh yeah, it's, it, it will happen this year. We will have the big Easter egg hunt or that we have always had at Howard Park. We'll have it again this year. Great, thank you. Yeah, I happen to like the uh, concept of the cafe. I think it's different. And even though we haven't done it in, in other parks, I don't think that should limit us uh and and yes there are a number of families that are using howard park but we got a number of young professionals as well and who like the outdoors and for them to have a place where they could bring their laptop and maybe grab a uh, a, a cup of coffee or green tea or whatever they drink that the younger generation um and so i think it would be very welcoming there so i, I kind of like the innovative idea of a, of a cafe in one in one of our parks 
uh, Commissioner Schof. Thank you, Mayor. And, and to the point of the cafe, uh, two thoughts. One, I was actually recently approached by a group of Palm Beach Atlantic students that were looking to do something like this. You know, either go into the public realm. They they said there's not a lot of places that we can go and and you know have a, a study lounge where it's acceptable to to speak. The, we obviously have a great library, but the, everything has to be kept to a minimum. They like things a little more casual. So I think having a concept like this is really great. And I guess. To Commissioner Lambert's point, I think the one thing that stood out in my mind that was very similar is what we do with the Dunkin' Donuts former space here in the library. It would be important to me, I think, to look to our local community and say what local business can come in here and thrive or expand or whatever the, the point may be. But I think in my mind, that's the one example I can think of that's most similar to you know having a publicly owned facility with a private operator in it. Yep. All right, any other Questions, comments? All right. Um, okay, Commissioner Fox. Sorry, one more logistic question. I know that both of the presentations talked a lot about security being something that was top of mind from the community. Do we have special security for the park, or is there anything that we're looking at? No, we, we, we don't. Um, we don't have a security officer at the park. Uh, because it, it, it does sit between Parker and um, Lake, it does offer itself to having patrols that go by there more frequently. Uh, though certainly lighting is will be huge as well as looking at septed while we're designing the building. So c construction design that um, does that helps to not create opportunities for crime and bad behavior. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, just one question since you brought up security. I know that right now with the time change, this is usually the time of year that I start to hear from families saying, hey, the park doesn't have lights on at night and, you know, we're getting off work at 530 and it's dark at 545. Did we ever remedy that or? So, yeah, the playground itself, we, we added lighting to the playground. So Great. it is. You can't, well, the walkway lighting has been has been upgraded, but we're in the process of um, lighting the playground itself. So we've created a safer way in and out, and we're in the process of upgrading the lighting to include the playground. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. I thought the parks were closed after sundown. Um, the parks are closed except for uh, lighted s facilities. So, for instance, a basketball court that is lighted would be open at night. A basketball court that is not lighted would not, that part of the park would not be open. Okay. Commissioner Shove. Thank you, Mayor. And, and just to summarize on this topic, um, Leah, because I know we have a number of parks that have penny sales tax projects associated with them, and some are in various stages. Can you just remind us what those projects are? So the, let's start on the south end. The Palmetto Park was a penny sales tax project uh, that included a new playground and some upgrades to the park itself. We are finishing up on just some of the minor um, concrete removal and benches that were there to put in some new, new benches and new seating. But that park has been completed as far as penny sales tax with the new playground. I'll make life a little easier just to summarize um, community centers that way because I know you have a number well, that, of that was the only one that's not okay. a community center then we have the Howard Park which is penny sales tax uh, Pleasant City Community Center was penny sales tax we are waiting for a final um, permit for our or our CO for the electrical permit to pass um, there's an issue in the kitchen that once that's corrected, we'll be able to open the community center to the community. So those renovations have been completed except for that one element. So we're hoping that that's corrected soon. And then that inspection, electrical inspection. And then um, the other penny sales tax project is Coleman Park, which we're in final design and permitting for Coleman Park. And then we have also um, Gaines Park, which we will start with design on Gaines Park. Uh, we've hired an architect to take 30% design plans to 100 and then go out for uh, construction. Lots of great things. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions or comments? Uh, 
Ms. Rockwell, do you have what you need? Yes, I do. Thank you very much for your input. And uh, we're excited to move forward with Howard Park Penny Sales Tax Project so that the community can have a great space to grow. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, both teams, for. Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. May I? I just wanted to introduce Edna um, Benelli. She is our engineer on the project, and she has been holding our hands throughout this with the architects. And she's been a, a has played a great role and we're thankful to have her as a part of our team. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, any uh, matters for the good of the order, commissioners? I don't have anything. Okay. Uh, well, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you.